If you've got a bunch of real-time lights in your game, this is gonna help you improve the performance by adjusting the shadow quality of those lights based on the distance from the active camera. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become reality by helping you improve the performance of your game by LODing lights. Now it's really important that this is only applicable to real-time lights. If you have a baked lighting, this is not going to help at all. Conceptually, all we're gonna do is throw this light LOD script on any runtime light, attach an LOD camera recognizer to our cameras. If you have multiple cameras, then you'll need to toggle which one's the currently active one, and we'll provide the mechanism for that as well. And then your performance should vastly increase if you have large numbers of lights. As always with optimization, your mileage will vary based on your scene complexity, the number of lights, all this kind of stuff, target hardware, disclaimers, disclaimers. Let's jump into the code. Let's start with the LOD adjustment. This is just a normal C# -sharp class that's serializable. In here, we'll make a public float min square distance, a public float max square distance, a public shadow resolution shadow resolution, a public light shadows light shadows, and a public color debug color. The square distances allow us to define in squared format the distance from the light to the player that this LOD adjustment should be active for. Calculating the actual distance requires you to do a square root, which is a relatively expensive operation. So this is just a little bit extra optimization. The shadow resolution allows us to adjust the quality of the shadows at each different LOD level. Same with the light shadows. We can go from none, soft, or hard shadows at each different adjustment. And just for fun for your own tooling, you can add in a public color debug color to visualize which color is currently active. If we open up the light LOD camera, which will attach to a camera, and it's going to be kind of what we look for and compare with our light LOD script. We just need a singleton, which I know not everyone likes singletons. This is just a simple way for us to be able to reference the active camera from a light LOD camera perspective. We'll make it require component type of camera. And I put in a reference to the camera. It turns out I don't actually need it, so I'm just going to remove it at the end. We'll make a public static light LOD camera instance that'll have a public git and a private set. So that way anybody can get the instance, but nobody besides this class can set it. On awake, we'll check if the instance is null. If it is, we're gonna set it to be this. So the first one will automatically be active and we'll have a helper function to say public void activate, which will allow us to change cameras by calling activate on this particular light LOD. So if you're toggling which one is the priority camera to be displayed at a particular time, you just call activate on the light LOD camera on that camera and all the light LODs would start adjusting to this new camera. If we open up the light LOD class, we'll make it require component type of a light and make a private light light that we'll assign on awake. We'll also make a public bool, light should be on to be true, a private float, update delay, set to be a range from zero to one, and we'll set to 0 0.1 by default. That'll be approximately how long we should wait on our coroutine to check the distance to the player because distance checking can be a little bit expensive. We're trying to optimize how frequently we call this. If you set it to be zero, we'll do it basically every frame. We'll make a serialized private list, LOD adjustment, LOD levels, and that'll control which LOD levels we actually have. On enable, we're going to start a coroutine to adjust the LOD quality. In our adjust LOD quality coroutine that we'll define as private I enumerator adjust LOD quality, we're going to do something that you're going to think is kind of weird, but I promise you I ran into this problem that caused spikes because of the script, and this is how I solved it. We're going to assign a float delay to be the update delay plus some value that will check first if the update delay is zero, because if it's zero, we're going to do it every frame, so we're not going to add any value. But if update delays anything besides zero, we're going to add Add in a small number, unityengine.random.value divided by 20, which is a random value between 0 and 1, and then we're going to divide that by 20, to give us a very slight offset so not all of our light LOD objects are trying to update on the same frame, assuming they all have the same update delay. A small number like this is highly unlikely to be noticeable by your player, and it prevents you from getting really big spikes. If you have like, I don't know, 100 lights or something that are doing this, you don't have 100 calls to adjust LOD quality every X number of frames. We'll then define a wait for seconds wait based on that delay, and we'll check while true. So we want this to constantly run, and just to make sure we don't freeze our game, we'll do yield return wait, and above that we'll do some logic. We'll put a guardian at the top to check if the light LOD camera instance is null. So if we have no active light LOD camera, we're just going to wait and come back to the top of the loop. Now we're going to check if the light should be on, we're going to do something. 
If the light shouldn't be on, we're going to set the light enabled to be false. So instead of toggling light.enabled, if you have like player interaction to disable light, you just toggle light should be on of the light LOD instead, and that'll automatically handle the light turning off. This is optional. You can ignore the light should be on if you don't like this approach. So if the light should be on, we're going to get the square magnitude between the light LOD camera and this light's position. This is significantly faster than running vector3.distance. Then we're going to iterate over all the LOD levels that we have. We're going to check if I is equal to the LOD levels count minus one, meaning it's the last one, or we're within the range of min and max square distance. We're doing that first check so you don't have to define some like infinitely large number for the max square distance on the last one. You can just leave it alone. That way we never run into a situation where we're outside of the LOD levels. So this is where we'll actually apply the LOD adjustments. We'll set the light to be enabled. We'll set the light.shadows to be this LOD level's light shadow. And we're going to clamp the light shadow resolution to the quality settings shadow resolution. So we'll check if the current resolution that we defined is actually greater than or equal to the light shadow resolution that's supported in the quality settings. We'll set it to be whatever's in the quality settings. Otherwise, we're going to set it to be whatever's in the light shadow resolution. That way we don't exceed whatever we configured on the quality settings by going in the LOD. And of course, we're going to break at the end of that so we don't keep going through more iterations after we found the right one. For our first demo, we'll look at if the shadow resolution is set to very high resolution in the quality settings so we can see all of the tiers come around. I saved a little bit of time so you didn't have to watch me just input a whole bunch of different values. You can see that we've defined min square distance of zero, meaning we can be all the way inside of it, up to 16, which is equivalent to four units. And then we start the next one at 16, which is four units to 49, which is seven units. And we kind of just stair step that way all the way down these getting progressively worse quality. So we start with very high soft shadows to high soft shadows to medium hard shadows to low hard shadows, and then eventually low off for the shadows. So we should see some very obvious swapping on some of these as we come to the very aggressive scaling light. So if you watch very closely on these shadows, especially on the sphere, you can tell it's hopping between different resolutions. At this point, there's no shadows. If I'm a little bit closer, there are some very low quality shadows. You can see the very obvious steps on the sphere. A little bit closer, we see that we're starting to get those medium hard shadows. Right here, we hit the high soft shadows. And when we're basically inside of it, we get the very high quality soft shadows. Each of these lights is configured a little bit differently, so we'll see different stepping, where on some of these, you probably can't really tell that it's swapping at all. And that's kind of the point. You don't want it to be obvious to the player that you're swapping these things out, but it really reduces the load on the GPU. We take the scene that's 32 real-time lights and I disable the light LOD script. So if I sit over here, we can see I'm getting like 190 FPS. It's pretty good. And we've got 1971 shadow casters. And we can see we have a really large amount of our profiling time taken up by render deferred lighting, which is kind of what we would expect to see. But this is a very simple scene. Probably we can do better by reducing those shadow qualities. This is just an example. So here we're getting about one and a half milliseconds for real-time deferred lighting. We go ahead and enable the light LOD. Let's see what the difference is. A similar location, meaning about 240 FPS, you can see that I'm using the moderate light scaling, which means the majority of these lights are actually rendering no shadows. So my shadow casters went from 1971 to 194. And I don't know what this random little jump is. So if we just look at a normal area, our rendering lighting is now taking 0.27 milliseconds down from almost one and a half. So obviously your mileage will vary. Different configurations will result in different performance uplifts, but we're taking about 18% of the time rendering lighting using this configuration than what we were doing before when we were rendering all the lights at full high quality shadows, which is a pretty awesome improvement. Just for fun, let's increase the distances of all of these LEDs and see how it goes. Okay, so about the same spot, still 210 to 20 FPS, somewhere in that range. We take a look at the profiler here. Now we have 0.6 milliseconds, which is still only 40% of the time that we were using before. And in this case, only objects that are quite far away aren't rendering shadows anymore. It's a little bit harder to tell that it's actually not rendering them. As we go further in here, you can see some shadows jumping in, which I would say is the biggest con of this approach. If you choose to have a quality setting of no lighting, usually you want that to be quite far out. In this case, 35 units or whatever I have, it's still pretty noticeable. I guess the last thing to look at is what does our coroutine time look like because we are trading off some rendering time and adding in some coroutine time. Here I got 0.06 milliseconds. That one seemed to be relatively high. Most of them are 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06 is the worst case scenario in my particular case here. And that's because we added in that random time 
on the weight. So you can see there's some really great performance benefits we can get if we have a large number of runtime lights, even with relatively simple scene geometry. Obviously more complex scene geometry means even more performance improvements because there's less and less detail that we calculate on those shadows. This is something that I implemented in my very first game and it was a huge performance benefit. I can't believe I actually forgot about it. It was recently somebody on YouTube commented on one on the video that I put up because it's on the asset store as well. And it reminded me that this was a huge benefit for me and I totally forgot to share it with you all. So I hope you got value out of this video. If you want to show your support in a different way, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, click join here on YouTube, get your name up here on the screen, get a voice shout out at the awesome tier and some other cool perks too. Being those awesome supporters, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Rulin, and Ify Obelis. And at the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.